Uh, Fidelity Bank, Axis Holdings and Zenit Bank among the latest uh, set of banks uh, releasing their third quarter earnings this week. Uh, they posted double-digit profit percentage increases and a rise in net interest income after impairment charges. Nabila Mohammed, banking sector analyst at Chapel Hill Denim, joins me now to unpack some of the numbers and the outlook for the equities market. Nabila, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Right. Uh, now, we've had a, a raft of earnings from the banks. I know this is one uh, set of earnings that the market always looks forward to. Now we have uh, the numbers in, especially from the big names, the so tier one banks, uh, Access Holdings. Uh, we have from Zenit Bank. We have from FBNH. Well, talk to me. Uh, looking across the numbers, for instance, uh, from Access Holdings, uh, talk to us about what you've been able to glean from the numbers and what story the numbers are telling. So the numbers are really telling that we have seen them deliver strong earnings since the first in the first nine months of the year. We have seen that they've maintained that trajectory largely as a result of the high interest rate environment that these banks are leveraging on. Um, however, what we like to reiterate is the fact that for banks that would want to really ex extract value from this high interest rate environment. They would also have to look into how well they manage their interest expense growth in the same period. And how would they do that? They really have to maintain a high uh, low cost deposit mix in order to reduce the amount they expend in terms of interest that they pay on their customer deposits. And we see the likes of Fidelity, we see the likes of um, UBA, we see the likes of GTCO with very high CASA mix. I'm speaking to around 93% for Fidelity. We have around 87% of their deposits as low-cost funds, which is sort of favorable for them in terms of interest earnings. Now, if we look at it on a Q3 standalone basis, not looking at you know how the first nine months have been, we see that there's been a bit of a slowdown, and it's largely because we've already if they have, these banks have already priced in that they've already taken advantage of the high yields, so we are not seeing so much in terms of interest income and uh, non interest net interest income, especially non interest income that's the monies they get from the FX revaluation gains, their fees and commission, and other trading income. We're not seeing so much strong figures in terms of Q3 standalone. So really, that is just the different thing with uh, the nine months results. When we look at it as a whole, it is still quite strong. And we expect that this will be the trajectory towards the end of the year. In fact, for the entire 2024, these banks will deliver strong numbers relative to the previous periods um, that we have seen them deliver. Mm, right. Uh, what about, I mean, a key metric like uh, increase in loan provision and looking at, uh, I'm looking at uh, the earnings from uh, access, uh, access holdings, a 52% increase in loan provision and also looking at cost to income ratio that also uh, climbed. Uh, of course, operating expenses actually doubled uh, this time, uh, driven by higher salaries and wages. Is that something you're keeping an eye on or it all balances out with the income that's coming from uh, the interest income and non-interest income? So most definitely, we did see um, uptick in terms of cost to income ratio, which is one of the metrics that we look at. Uh, and for some banks, uh, what we noticed was that they didn't have as much strong non-interest income that they did in FY um, uh, 2023. So that sort of reduced the positive impact that we have seen previously in terms of cost to income ratios moderating to very low levels. Um, that uh, line is not as big or as huge as it was in 2023, and that is slightly what is impacting that. Now, in terms of um, loan uh, provisioning, you would agree with me that given the uh, microeconomic headwinds and the challenges that we're facing um, in the environment in terms of um, customers being able to service their obligations as and when they are supposed to, these banks are just taking proactive measures in order to provide uh, provision for all the loans that they have in their books. And this is a requirement if we're just judging by the prudential guidelines as stipulated by the CBN. Banks are actually expected to do that provisioning. So it depends on how the assets or the assets that are earning this interest are performing in the period. If they are deteriorating, it will definitely warrant the banks to really take adequate provision for these loans in order to avoid any form of um, um, ripple effects that it will have in terms of their earnings and in terms of their entire asset quality. So 
that is what it's something that we would expect them to do. So we're seeing some high numbers. Of course, we're seeing high cost of risk in terms of uh, like for the likes of um, Zenith Bank. We're seeing in terms of access as you rightly put, and it is just based on the management. Um, view in terms of how they look at their asset quality and how they are supposed to provide for all the loans that they have booked during the period and also put into consideration the fact that customers will most likely have it difficult when it comes to servicing their obligations. Right. And uh, I mean, you talked about the soft operating environment uh, ability of SME companies uh, to service their uh, debt. Uh, what, is, what is to be said right now of the loan book growth of the banks? Uh, where, what, what percentage are we looking at now? In terms of poor loan growth, I don't know if I can Loan book growth for the bank, loan book growth across the board. So it is modest. It is not um, as big as a number. So even if we see, for instance, loan growth just on the surface value, looking at around 25, 35 percent, we should also remember that these banks have uh, FX um, related assets or loans, as you may want to call it, that accounts for giving the devaluation that we've seen since the start of the year. They have that extra effects related loan growth that is also impacting their overall loan growth. But overall, what we based on our engagement with management, they have also disclosed that the loan for loan growth itself, that in terms of the the actual growth that we have seen in loans, it is modest and it's not as uh, based on what we see on the surface of the statement or the financials that they release. Right. So it has been modest across board. Right. Finally, we have uh, less than a minute. Uh, uh, can we expect these uh, strong earnings to drive uh, a rally in the market going forward? I know it's just a, Thursday, we have just one more trading day left. Uh, what do you expect in terms of how investors are going to cherry pick and how these numbers are going to shape trading uh, going forward? So really, we have seen these banks to start with in terms of dividend announcements. They have announced some, some in some cases times two what they paid in terms of income for last year, I'm speaking to the likes of GTCO and Zenith. I've also seen um, UBA, for instance, um, more than four times what it's paid as interim. So there is that expectation on the part of investors that these banks will pay a very um, sizable um, final year dividend, and which is what we would expect given the trajectory that they have come from, looking at it from page one standpoint. So this is the period where we'd expect some cherry picking. In fact, if we look at just intraday, we have the likes of GTCO up, um, uh, we have Fidelity up as well. We also have access. So right. These are investors that understand that the current valuation of these banks is really cheap and they can actually take position. Another thing that could potentially spur um, investor sentiment is when uh, a particular bank announces that they are done with the capital verification right. exercise and they have been verified by the regulators. Right. Thank you so much, Nabila. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for walking us through uh, those uh, numbers. Nabila Mohammed, Banking Sector Analyst at Chapel Hill, Dana